By the late 1980s, Star Trek was riding high on the big screen, with its latest outing Star Trek IV The Voyage Home being the most commercially successful film in the franchise at the time. Although a Star Trek trilogy of sorts had concluded, William Shatner was keen to take the helm for a fifth movie. The result was certainly one of the most memorable Star Trek adventures, for better or for worse. <laughs> As stated in the previous video of this series, back during the original series, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy had secured a favoured nations clause in their contracts. This meant that for all Star Trek related projects, any perks such as a pay rise or script control which one of the actors received, so would the other and vice versa. With Nimoy having directed the previous two Star Trek movies, Paramount was obliged to offer the same opportunity to William Shatner. While negotiating to reprise the role of Captain Kirk in Star Trek IV, Shatner was promised the chance to direct the next film and help craft its story. Shatner's primary inspiration for his story were televangelists, who Shatner found repulsive and horrifying, but also deeply fascinating. He saw them as shameless exploiters, getting rich off the back of those genuinely seeking help. This led to Shatner creating a character named Azar, the leader of a cult-like group who could control others with telepathic abilities, searching the cosmos for God. In Shatner's original outline, the Enterprise would be overwhelmed by Zar's superior forces, with everyone coming to believe in Zar's quest, except Kirk, who would fake his belief in order to remain on the Enterprise in the hopes of freeing his crew. The journey would take them to a fiery waste of a planet, where an entity appears to them as God, but when questioned, this entity would transform into a satanic-like figure, who Kirk would have to outwit to save his friends. Producer Harv Bennett, who had been working on the Star Trek feature films for seven years by this point, was exhausted by the demanding productions and wanted to move on to other projects. However, following a lengthy discussion with Shatner, he agreed to return for Star Trek V. Bennett raised several issues with Shatner's outline, particularly with the ending of the film. He felt no on-screen depiction of God could ever satisfy audience expectations and suggested changing the entity to an alien being pretending to be God. Gene Roddenberry disliked the entire idea of the characters searching for God, especially a God as depicted by Western religions. By this point, Roddenberry was a famously outspoken atheist whose vision of the future didn't include organised religion of any kind. Roddenberry, along with Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly, also objected to the idea of Spock and McCoy betraying Kirk and siding with Tsar. To revise the treatment and write the script, Bennett and Shatner approached Wrath of Khan writer-director Nicholas Meyer, but he was unavailable at the time. Eventually, David Lowry was hired as writer. However, a writer's strike delayed Lowry turning in his first draft, and when Nimoy had to leave to work on another project, production was delayed even further. The revised scripts changed Zar's name to Cybok, and overall made the character much more sympathetic. Paramount also grew concerned about the film going over budget due to the film's climax, which involved an epic battle featuring angels and demons. To rein in the scope, these angels and demons were changed to rock monsters which the god entity would animate from the ground. At first the sequence featured six of these monsters, but eventually it was reduced to just one. During this struggle to nail down a script which satisfied everyone, Paramount execs became concerned about losing the momentum generated by Star Trek IV, and so rushed the film into pre-production, despite having lost time due to the writer's strike. Initially, George Takei didn't want to reprise his role as Sulu. He and Shatner had a famously antagonistic relationship over the years, and Takei didn't want to be directed by Shatner. However, he was eventually convinced to return, and to his surprise, had a pleasant time making the film, as did many others. Despite his flaws, Shatner's ability to maintain a high energy level and passion while working put most of the cast and crew in good spirits, despite the behind-the-scenes pressure. For the role of Cybok, Shatner and Paramount executives wanted Sean Connery for the part. In fact, the planet Shakari, where the god entity is found in the script, was named after the actor. However, they were unable to meet his salary demands. Shatner later recommended Lawrence Luckinbill after seeing his PBS one-man stage show of Lyndon Johnson. Luckinbill is in fact the son-in-law of Lucille Ball, co-owner of Desilu Productions, which produced Star Trek the original series, and he is also uncle to the Wachowskis who created The Matrix. For a trio of human, Romulan and Klingon diplomats on the ruined outpost paradise, David Warner, Cynthia Gao and Charles Cooper were cast. 
David Warner would later play Chancellor Gorkon in Star Trek VI, as well as Gul Madred in Star Trek The Next Generation's Chain of Command. Cooper would also appear in Star Trek The Next Generation as Klingon Chancellor Kempek. For the other new Klingon characters in the film, stuntman Todd Bryant, who had also worked with Shatner on TJ Hooker, was cast as Commander Kla. Actress and bodybuilder Spice Williams was cast as Kla's first officer, Vixis. For the role of God, George Murdoch was cast. He would also appear in The Next Generation as Admiral Hansen. For the film's art direction and production design, Shatner worked with art director Nilo Rodis and production designer Herman Zimmerman. Shatner wanted a more grounded, grittier look to the film, and worked well with Rodis in conceiving the overall look of the movie. Shatner also wanted to design new Starfleet uniforms, but budget constraints prevented this, although Rodis did design new brown field uniforms and larger phasers. Herman Zimmerman created a new bridge design for the Enterprise A. At the end of Star Trek IV, the bridge of the Enterprise A was a repaint of the same bridge set used from the previous Star Trek movies. This new set featured far more light and graphics, designed once again by Michael Okuda. Zimmerman also designed a new Klingon Bird of Prey set, and the Paradise City set. A handful of sets from Star Trek The Next Generation were also used in the film, such as Corridor sets and Sickbay. Filming commenced in October 1988, and immediately ran into trouble from industrial action, specifically Union truck drivers, who went on strike, preventing the essential filming equipment making it to location. There was such bad blood between the drivers and the production, one of the filming trucks exploded from possible sabotage. Eventually, non-Union drivers were found who moved the trucks late at night to Yosemite National Park to begin filming. For the opening sequence, a wooden replica of the El Capitan rock face was built at a parking lot overlooking the park, which Shatner climbed up. Leonard Nimoy was stood on a crane arm to simulate Spock levitating thanks to his rocket boots. After Yosemite, filming moved to the Mojave Desert to shoot the Nimbus 3 and Shakari scenes. Filming in the extreme heat took a toll on many cast and crew, with exhaustion setting in quickly. The harsh conditions also led to frayed tempers and the occasional shouting match. By the time filming moved back to Paramount Studios, the general mood improved and production quickly moved ahead of schedule. As well as the spacecraft interior sets, several exteriors were also created. A stand-in set was created for Shakari for scenes which would be intercut with location footage. While filming, the crew attempted to execute the rock monster effect, as described in the script, with a practical suit being built around a stunt performer. The inner workings of the suit were complex, allowing the monster to breathe fire on command. However, these mechanics broke down during filming, and few were happy with the resulting footage. Shatner said, Our guy in a silly rubber suit ultimately just looked like, well, a guy in a silly rubber suit. The monster, dubbed Rockman, was cut from the film, and the climax had to be hastily rewritten and edited. The final scenes to be shot were the campfire scenes. Soon after the rap party, a press conference was called, attended by all the principal cast on the Enterprise bridge set. Soon after, Shatner went on to tackle the post-production work. For the film's visual effects, Industrial Light and Magic, which had handled the effects in Star Trek II, were unavailable as they were busy working on Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, as well as Ghostbusters 2. After shopping the film around to various visual effects studios, Paramount hired Associates and Ferron, headed by Brad Ferron. But to create the visual effects, the tight schedule only allowed for three months for Ferron to do the work, around half the usual time frame. Rather than the motion-controlled camera techniques used by ILM, Ferron used rear projection techniques to try and capture as many elements in camera as possible. Despite their cost-saving attempts, the VFX budget was much higher than anticipated, and so several shots had to be cut. To replace the original rock monster sequence, Brad Ferron proposed an amorphous blob of light which could chase Kirk. Shatner was very disappointed by the resulting shots, but Paramount wasn't able to spend the money needed to reshoot, and so the shots were left as they were. Overall, it became evident Associates and Ferron didn't have the resources to handle the work, and the tight schedule and budget only exacerbated these problems. For the film's score, Jerry Goldsmith returned, having previously composed the Oscar-nominated score for the motion picture. For Star Trek V, Goldsmith was keen to write some more action-oriented cues, which were largely absent from the motion picture. Goldsmith brought back the theme from the motion picture, this time combined with the opening from Alexander Courage's original series theme. Goldsmith also brought back the Klingon theme from the motion picture, albeit with a different tempo and a ram's horn added in. By the 80s, Goldsmith regularly experimented with synthesizers and used them several times in the Star Trek V score. 
a leitmotif for Cybok in particular leans heavily on synthesized sounds. In general, Goldsmith's score for Star Trek V was much wider in scope, with a larger amount of leitmotifs as opposed to the two primary theme structure of the motion picture. For the film's edit, Shatner had a hard time building a new ending for the film, as well as integrating the controversial visual effects shots. At the same time, Paramount demanded a runtime of approximately 1 hour 45 minutes, whereas Shatner pushed for a 2 hour runtime. Early test screenings for the film garnered a poor reception, and so quick reshoots, rewrites, and harsh edits were made before the film was received more positively. The production had been plagued with problems, but on the 9th of June 1989, Star Trek V The Final Frontier made its debut. Star Trek V The Final Frontier is often named as the worst of the franchise's big screen outings, and unfortunately it's easy to see why. Its rushed production and cobbled together edit are clearly reflected in the end product. The plot never quite comes together in a cohesive way, and the pacing feels off from the start. There are many interesting ideas in the film, but none of them are given the time or attention to really be explored in any depth. Ultimately, the audience is left with far more questions than answers. We never get a satisfying answer to what this god entity actually is, and the quest to reach the fabled Shakari feels like it ended before it even began. The great barrier at the centre of the galaxy, for example, is traversed without so much as a console sparking. That's not to say there's nothing to like here. Shatner generally does a pretty decent job as a director, and DOP Andrew Laszlo's work gives the film that more grounded feel Shatner was going for. There's great use of shadows and darkness to shape each shot. There are also moments of great acting from the regular cast, in particular to Forrest Kelly when Cybok exposes McCoy's guilt over euthanizing his own father. Luckinbill himself is a strong antagonist as Cyborg. He really nails that cult of personality, and you believe others would follow him on his quest. What's disappointing, though, is the revelation of Cyborg being Spock's half-brother. Not because the concept itself is bad, but nothing much is done with it in the actual film. Nimoy and Luckinbill don't really share much interesting dialogue. As a result, Cyborg being Spock's half-brother doesn't amount to anything. Jerry Goldsmith's score for the film is fantastic, but then again, his work is always strong. I've said before his theme for the motion picture is what I tend to think of as the Star Trek theme, and The Final Frontier's new rendition of it is terrific. The synthesizers really add a lot of texture to the score, and the action cues are top-notch. Honestly, the theme he introduces after the opening march, and then uses later for Shakari, is one of the most beautiful tracks I've ever heard in a film. Just excellent work all around. The visual effects, though, really do suffer. Whether it's to be blamed on incompetence or lack of time slash money, the shots were largely subpar for the time and haven't aged well at all. The quality of the optical work is all over the place, with several elements looking either hand-drawn or stop-motion animated, despite being shot with actual miniatures. The colours often look very washed out and flat, and the same goes for the general compositions as well. There's a lack of dynamism to the movement, with most ships just going from one side of the screen to the other, without any kind of interesting camera moves. Whenever the film reuses some of ILM's work from the previous films, the difference is night and day. I don't think Star Trek V is an unpleasant viewing experience, but it's certainly an odd one. There's an attempt to recapture the humour of Star Trek IV, but more often than not it comes across as cringy and out of place rather than charming. Uhura's feather dance and Kirk wrestling with a triple-breasted Catwoman are just kind of baffling. I think the biggest problem with the film is Shatner trying to recapture the kinds of adventures featured in the original series, despite the franchise having moved beyond that kind of style. The cast are noticeably much older, yet Kirk begins the film free-climbing El Capitan as if he's some kind of prime athlete, not to mention other haphazardly staged action sequences throughout, which aren't very convincing. Captain's Lock, Stardate 6051. Had trouble sleeping last night. My hiatal hernia is acting up. The ship is drafty and damp. I complain, but nobody listens. Star Trek 12. So very tired. The previous three Trek films made efforts to really progress these characters and have them grow, whereas Star Trek V tries to carry on like business as usual. In a way, it reminds me of A View to a Kill, where Roger Moore was blatantly too old for the role of James Bond by that point. The strange juxtaposition of these elements actually made it worthy of being the subject of the Watch Party series on another channel of mine, similar to what we did with Spock's brain, which I mentioned back in part one of this series. Oh, Huda, I thought you were on leave. 
I thought you were retired. <laughs> oh, I thought you were dead. <laughs> I was at someone's funeral. <laughs> While there are bits to be liked in this film, it's easily the weakest of the first six films. Personally, it isn't my least favourite of the Star Trek movies in general, but I understand why so many fans rank it at the bottom. It's poorly plotted, strangely paced, and full of real head scratchers. That being said, I don't think it's anywhere near the kind of atrocity it's sometimes made out to be. I can find some entertainment while watching, even if it is simply to laugh at the film rather than laugh with it. The soundtrack is excellent, and there are some great character moments sprinkled in here and there. But overall, I think most would agree The Final Frontier was a real low point for Star Trek on the big screen. Upon release, The Final Frontier was met with mixed to negative reviews from critics, and a similarly poor reception from fans. While the performances of the cast were praised, many criticised the messy script and lower than expected production values. Reflecting on the film, many of the cast and crew share the low opinion of the movie. Shatner himself later called it a failed but glorious attempt at a thought-provoking film that didn't come together. Equally disappointing was the film's box office performance. While it did debut at number one, with an opening weekend larger than any previous Star Trek film, The Final Frontier finished its theatrical run with only $63 million worldwide, on a budget of $33 million. While it did sell well on home video, this gross fell well short of analyst expectations, some of which were as high as $200 million. Part of this can be blamed on the summer release date, which put the film in competition with anticipated hits, like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Lethal Weapon 2, License to Kill, and Batman. At the time of the film's release, Star Trek The Next Generation had also started its run, and Harve Bennett believed this dampened enthusiasm for a Star Trek movie. Collectively, all those involved with the making of the film expressed regret and disappointed over the conception, production, and release, with many believing they had played a part in killing the movie series. Few were expecting a follow-up film after such a disastrous fifth installment, but as 1991, the 25th anniversary of the original series, was just around the corner, Harv Bennett thought he could take one last crack at it. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members, where you can see videos early, as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.